Okay, looks like mortgage interest rates have broken through that 5% barrier. So cue the housing bubble burst crash discussion. Uh, we're going to, you know, hear a lot of this going on now. We're going to hear a lot from both ends of the spectrum, both perspectives. Uh, we'll talk about that shortly. So welcome to Housing Bubble 2.0 News of the Week, or as I like to call it, another episode of As the Housing Market Turns. Randy Patrick here putting the realism back in real estate. Hope you are doing well. Today is April the 6th. We're, we're starting our uh, the new month here, chatting about what's going on. It is very busy. Stuff is happening at breakneck speeds now in the housing market. It's like every day something new happens. you got to keep up with it. This video is brought to you by our friends at foreclosure.com. So if you want to check out distressed property listings in your area, your neighborhood, your neck of the woods, go to gethousingdata.com. That's gethousingdata.com. Foreclosure.com is my affiliate partnership relationship here, and they are the number one provider of distressed property listings across the nation. So check it out, gethousingdata.com. Thank you. So basically... Um, I'm going to sort of talk about just some sentiment, like I'm talking about what I'm seeing in the marketplace here and what I'm reading online, etc. Because I think it's important that, you know, we know what the housing narrative is. We sort of know where it's headed and we know people are always going to be on either side of it. So at least this case, we can really talk about what's happening in the marketplace. Because for me, I like the feet on the street. I like to know what's happening and get get it from people who are, get information from people who are actually doing the business not just talking about it and prognosticating about it. So this basically says here, um, you know, um, uh, I guess you could say that according to a report with uh, Realtor.com, 64% of prospective 2022 sellers anticipate doing so the next six months to hit the spring and summer season. Um, when asked why they're planning to list in 2022, surveyed sellers' top reason was wanting to profit off the current market, all right, uh, compared to those who planned to list last spring. This year's prospective sellers have higher expectations of the hot housing market, including asking more for their uh, home is worth, all right, and also refusing to pay for repairs or improvements. So that's actually when, if we want to tag in the past couple of videos, that's housing bubble theory uh, 101, that's exuberance, that's froth. So basically, if you're a seller, you're going, well, the reason why I want to sell because I can profit from it. All right, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna actually you know price my property higher than what it's worth because we're gonna push the envelope and that could be with help from the real estate agents and we're gonna refuse to pay for repair or improvements. So basically, if the market's this hot with low inventory and all these things going for it. Um, you know, we're gonna just we're gonna ask for the world and see what happens. So really, no concessions here. So really, buyers in, in this case are gonna have to uh, you know no inspections or they're not going to uh, account for that type of thing in their price points or repairs. In negotiation. So again, just an example as to as to where people are at with their head in this housing market. And when you see stuff like this, it's like okay, uh, makes you want to run out and put an offer on a property right away. I mean, come on, right? So these people have to come back down to earth at some point in time. We're also seeing the rising foreclosures could signal gr a growth in, in consumer stress. Uh, the end of forbearance programs just puts added pressure on the U.S. households. Now, this is actually kind of an interesting. Um, article here because it's actually from a different perspective here so uh, this is they're talking to people who are from a company called legal shield and again I'm not endorsing them or anything I'm just saying this is what the article is about so legal shield we've seen it online we've seen commercials on it legal shield is a company serving two million households with a wide range of legal services uh, basically uh, it's interesting because they're tracking their calls and again this is not a real estate brokerage firm. This is not a lender. This is basically a legal company who, which has advice and you can buy services, et cetera, and documents, whatever. So um, they're obviously seeing an uptick in real estate calls as far as trends are concerned. And it's it's almost like they and has found them to be a valid and reliable leading indicator of what's happening in the marketplace. So when we see a significant increase in calls from people calling about foreclosures, we know that it's going to have an impact or a negative impact on Home sales, housing starts, and mortgage applications," said the CEO um, of Legal Shield, which I thought was really interesting. So, see how this kind of plays out here. This, so this is what you know. This is not the real estate industry. This is a support. Um, this is a different industry that maybe has some support for the real estate industry. And this is what they're saying about this. So um, he says he's seen an increase in negative calls about housing, including people facing eviction from a rental property. Uh, he notes that this increase closely correlates with the expiration of eviction moratoriums and forbearance programs that were enacted years ago to minimize the economic damage. Uh, and now that these programs are ending, 
the extent of the economic damage and consumer stress is now being revealed, which is very interesting. All right. It was a particularly, and this is his, his comments here, it was a particularly regressive policy decision to tell people to shelter at home or lock down. By that, I mean people who can only make their living by leaving their home were adversely affected. It's especially hard on women. And this could result in an increased number of for homes foreclosed in months ahead. At least that's what uh, the call trends are telling him. So basically, we're concerned about the trends. We see that for the last four months, the number of calls about foreclosures has been increasing. Funny enough, that correlates to the moratoriums being gone, forbearance programs coming coming uh, due and passing, uh, like he said here. Uh, it's a sign that there will be a change in number of foreclosures as well as a negative impact on the housing market overall. So again, not an economist, not uh, a journalist, just somebody who has an industry that doesn't even focus on real estate, but you see what type of information they're getting. I find that very insightful. Foreclosures to spike higher. Um, again, this one I have a little bit of an issue with. So Adam Data Solutions, you know, obviously they produce a lot of data uh, and I quote them and I use them quite frequently in my videos because I think they're pretty decent, but they have a couple of subsidiaries. One of them is Realty Track, which basically is their foreclosure um, arm. They, they sell, you know, like the same thing, you know, like access to listings and stuff like that. So um, what he's saying here is that, uh, that, that, that right now we're seeing an increase in, in foreclosure filings and foreclosure activity, but this, is, this isn't an indication of economic turmoil or of weakness in the housing market. It's simply the gradual return to normal levels of foreclosure activity after two years of artificially low numbers due to government industry efforts to protect financially impacted homeowners from defaulting. That is a mouthful, all right? Um, so that's what his perspective is. Now, I got to tell you, I, you know, I thought I was listening to these guys back in 2020 thinking they had a handle on this and they were talking, you know, in ways that would make sense. Um, something happened to them and I, I'm going to say they became, for lack of better words, enlightened or woke on this subject. And uh, ultimately now they've kind of changed their tune that, that all the stuff we're seeing is in line with a normal with a normal um, you know, marketplace, which I, I agree with that to an extent, but what we don't know is how this is going to manifest out. So, But with all the other economic challenges consumers are now facing, like what? Like inflation, okay? Like, um, you know, um, no more stimulus money, stuff like that. So, you know, um, foreclosures bear watching since they could be an early sign of more than economic damage. And now when we're adding the, the interest rate um, you know, increases to this, uh, that's where we're going to probably see some problems here. So it's interesting that, you know, again, I'm, there's two sides to this, right? So I'm not saying that I'm 100% right and everybody's 100% wrong, but it's interesting because people are signaling which side they want to be on. And typically that's because of what? It's because it, that's, that's where your, your uh, bread's buttered, essentially. It's where your income's coming, all right? So, um, or, or for whatever other political reasons, et cetera. So, interesting here, the Business Times in Colorado, property foreclosure activity continues to pick up in Mesa County. Uh, basically, um, the administrative coordinator of a title company in Grand Junction says that 80 foreclosure filings and seven foreclosure sales were reported in the first quarter. That's up from two filings and seven sales for the first quarter of 2021. While eye-catching, the increase is surprising. This was, a, this was to be expected as catch-up following the moratorium. So that's right. So we are going to see an increase uh, in these proper, in, in foreclosure filings and activity. It is going to have some impact in the market. Um, it's been choked off for two years and it's been downplayed for two years. So um, again, going back to the Adam guy, basically he's saying it's a natural progression. Well, it is, but I think we're going to see natural plus a little bit extra, all right? That's, I guess, my point here. And that will change the dynamics of the market significantly. Um, again, from California, when California legislators voted last June to extend the eviction protections, they promised a third time would be a charm. But the state's rent relief program continues to lag. Enough is enough, said, um, um, I think this is the California Renters Association president, by halting applications for those in need and extending the eviction moratorium, Rental housing providers are being forced to carry the financial weight of the pandemic, and some of them will lose their properties as a result. So, exactly right. So, listen, with the rental properties, there's always going to be a need for rental properties in, in, in a lot of different demographics because not everybody can afford a house. People are transitioning. People are going, you know, into their new careers, renting before they buy, relocate. One of those reasons that rental accommodation is required, and not everybody wants to, you know, live in a multifamily 300, 400 unit location. So people want to rent duplexes, quads, or single family homes. The point, though, is that based on a lot of the government's policies, the moratorium, uh, the eviction moratorium, and the fact that there's all this money that has been earmarked 
for landlords, which they have difficulty getting at, and there's lots of conditions, etc. It's it's putting financial pressure on them. And as, as she said here, some of them will lose their properties as a result. They'll lose them to foreclosure, or they'll sell them at a discount just to get rid of them to get rid of the headache. So who does this hurt? It hurts the landlords, hurts the economy, hurts the renters in there, because guess what? If it goes to foreclosure, new buyers going to come in, and those renters will be removed, if not beforehand, well, they'll be evicted. So a lot of stuff can happen. But again, this was part of the process. So when you go back in time, two years ago, when these moratoria came into place, well, what, what's good about that? Well, it, it, it's good for a short term. When they extend for a very long, longer t uh, than planned, that basically hurts a lot of people and it hurts this, this segment. I, I thought from initially when they did this that the target uh, was the ma and pa small landlord investors who own one to ten homes, all right? I thought that was the target of this and that they were the ones that either either this was retirement money or this was the rental was income supporting their life livelihood and that they would be the most exposed and, and it's true. Uh, and I think this was a, a definite target, and um, you no, know, there was more behind the scenes as to why they're going after this marketplace because they want this to happen. They want these to go to foreclosure, so the other big businesses and the Wall Streets groups, the hedge funds, and other big investors can purchase them up at the auction, stuff like that. So it's really a wealth transfer exercise here, guys, as far as I'm concerned. But now people are talking about back then it was just we're going to protect people from the pandemic. Now it's like okay, people are going to get creamed uh, and, and shellacked here in in the <laughs> you know, in the outcome and the aftermath of what happens here, okay? From here, uh, Arizona PBS, rent in the Metro Phoenix area is skyrocketing, climbing 80% between 2016 and 2021. Meanwhile, median household income only rose 22% during those years. So, like we've always said, whether it's a, a housing bubble we're in on a price point for purchase, home price appreciation, or the rental bubble we have now, the issue has been both the house price appreciation and, and rent increases have not kept pace, or sorry, wages have not kept pace with those increases. So, you know, if median households only risen 22%, but the rental market's risen 80%, that's a pretty big disconnect there, right? So basically, um, you know, obviously, um, you know, um, some people are spending all of their income on rent, um, and they just can't go on, people can't afford it, which is the truth. So people are getting stuck now, okay? So what, what are you gonna have? People are not gonna move. Or they're going to, you know, shack up with more people, share costs, um, you know, house hack, whatever they can do to reduce the exposure and reduce expenditures uh, in the in their accommodation. So whether it's rental or whether it's uh, it's purchasing, so this does have an impact on people. And I guess, you know, ultimately in the end, it's the word unsustainable, right? How long can we go before everything cracks? We're we're way past unsustainable right now, and we're getting towards cr cracking. Uh, territory as we speak right now. So uh, very interesting, but this is good because we're seeing little pieces of information from different parts of the country, from different perspectives, which, you know, it is to me shows that there's a lot greater or more more issues going on uh, than what's being told to us in the, in the general housing uh, mainstream media narrative out there. So, but guys, hey, listen, if you're not a subscriber to my channel and you appreciate the information I provide, please, you can subscribe that, uh, smash the subscribe button, subscribe to my channel. I would really appreciate that. Helps my channel grow. And if you are a subscriber, guess what? If you could please reaffirm, just check it out, resubscribe because I do lose more that I put on. It's just the nature of this business and some of the things going behind the scenes. So I appreciate the patronage, guys. Thank you very much. All right, let's keep moving on here. So next slide. Um, this is interesting. So what's next for the U.S. housing bubble? As I mentioned, first thing, now that we see an increase, substantial increase in mortgage interest rates, um, we're going to see a slowdown in the marketplace. That should be the effect. Will price points drop? How will these foreclosures manifest every month as they increase and as everything builds? So we've got uh, some quick little snapshots of some articles here. Uh, you know, what's next for the U.S. housing bubble? Industry experts break down the bull and the bear cases for home prices in the months ahead. All right, so this is really going to be just high-level headlines here, but I just wanted to show that we're starting to see more of this discussion, more people who are saying we're going to have some problems here. A chief economist who called the 2008 housing crisis warns the U.S. housing market is in the early stages of a substantial downshift, all right, as demand subsides and says surging home prices and rents are due to cool off in a big way. Okay, uh, this guy is the founder and chief U.S. economist for looks like Pantheon Macroeconomics. Uh, breaks down why he thinks the growth of home prices and activity in the market uh, is due for a big pullback. All right, so uh, as I said, these are not you know people uh, with no credentials and no experience. 
make any statements. These are, you know, again, like truly educated with, you know, accredited uh, people who know what they're talking about or work for companies or own the companies or are the figureheads of the companies making these uh, these um, statements out here, which I think should hold some weight. Are we on the verge of a housing bubble bust? An economist advises buyers to sit out the current irrational market and list the 11 most overvalued cities in the U.S. So basically, an economist at Florida Atlantic University said in March that current market dynamics were irrational and recommended waiting to buy homes. Well, he said the entire U.S. market is overvalued. Some markets were frothier than others. I love that word, frothy. Okay, um, and basically, like I've got, you know, there's you can look it up. Just go to Florida Atlantic University uh, overvalued home uh, home locations. You'll pull up a, uh, an article on that. It's got a whole chart. Okay, so it, it lists like you know, again, like a hundred of them basically. Okay, but the, the point though is that now we're hearing from economists, edu you know, educators, the whole bit. They're chiming in now because they're seeing this. They wouldn't chime in. If it didn't make sense, uh, and also a lot of these people don't have a narrative to to um, I guess you could say to hang their coat on. You know, they're not mortgage brokers. They're not you know real estate agents who want you to keep buying at high price um, you know um, high price uh, points and, and mortgages to keep you just cranking those mortgages. I mean, the Fed is in, you know they they've raised the, the the loan limits, but they've also you know in, also um, raised the interest rates because they know they're going to have to. You know they got to accommodate for stuff like that coming in the future, right? So everything is everyone's complicit at some point in time, in some way in this whole process here. So out of town home buyers are driving up real estate prices in these ten overvalued cities, and it's fueling housing bubble fears. So sticking with the more granular view of the U.S. housing market, um, the real estate brokers Redfin identified February report ten cities where housing prices were driven up by outside investors. That's obviously a picture of Nashville, Tennessee. Nashville is a location where people are relocating. So obviously with the pandemic and, and you know, um, dollar values and political climate and social climate and tax, property tax and state tax and income tax and things like that, there's a whole, you know, a whole plethora of reasons why people are relocating. And obviously a lot of them have picked certain locations they want to flock to. So uh, people have done that and they're going there. And, and so, yeah, it's like the out-of-town people. If you can cash out or sell from your place, which is expensive at a higher dollar value, you're going to a, a, a less expensive place and you're buying cash or you're getting more bang for your buck, clearly you're going to purchase and you're going to buy up, drive up prices because you've got the money. You're not worried about it. Everyone wants a deal. But listen, you can afford to go up a few notches in your price points uh, to secure that home because in the end, it's the quality of life and the other benefits on you know personal income tax, state tax, whatever that is, all the things that you're, the reasons why you're leaving, going someplace new that doesn't have the reasons why you're leaving, you're okay to pay a bit more because you feel confident you're gonna, it's gonna work out for you in the end. So again, we've seen a lot of that. It's a lot of basically people shifting. The pandemic has caused us to reevaluate our entire lifestyle, our working lifestyle, our, our living situations, etc. And now with a lot of the advent of you know working from home or working you know different different work share environments, you don't have to be in the big city. You don't have to be in that location. You got more flexibility. Um, also, a heightened appetite for flipping may be a sign of bubble in the market. Some say that is true. So really, um, that's like before a housing crash. You see ex like the words exuberance. You see greed. You see the word froth going on. You see flipping at all time peaks. Um, you know what I mean? Profitability starts to reduce in flipping because where we're at now um, with respect to higher price points on acquisition for flippers, also higher price points and supply chain issues on materials, etc., to, to you know fix up and rehab property. So uh, all these things kind of coincide together. And again, it's not usually one thing that causes problems. It's a multiple things happening at the same time that really opens the cracks up and changes the market. So essentially, it's the housing market setting up for a crash. Again, they, they, you know, they're sharing the warning signs that a real estate downfall is coming. So ultimately, in the end, you've got a lot of people who are chiming in saying, this is the deal. We're seeing the markets change. A lot of things are going to happen uh, right now. And you know, will we have an all-out crash? That's to be debated. Um, will it be a softer landing crash? Potentially. Will it be some corrections going on? I think so. Will it start and uh, will it be a national thing? I think we'll see in, in various locations first uh, that are suffering. Uh, but in the end, it's going to be a total drag down. And also, I think it's it's a lot of it's going to be a social thing, uh, like almost like a social um, like a social media type thing. I mean, we have much more 
access to information and and, and, and like, look, I'm, I'm picking out stuff from all different parts of the country, right? Which goes to show you that it's not just a certain a couple locations the sentiment is in. The sentiment's in everywhere, okay? People are feeling this way about a lot of stuff all over the place, all right? And, and that goes to show that we're not off in our beliefs, that we're pretty much aligned with what everyone's thinking. And now we've got the economists chiming in that, hey, yeah, I, we see some problems happening here. Let's monitor. No one's going to come out and call a crash because that's just, you know, I guess you would say corporate suicide or reputational suicide, etc. Um, people don't do that, but they're, they're laying the groundwork and saying signs are there. You know, you make up your mind from all the things we're talking about. Yeah, the signs are there. Okay, we're seeing it right now. Now, as I mentioned, we have two separate markets all for the past couple of years. We have the retail market, which is on market going on. You know, keep buying those high priced properties. You know, you get that FHA loan, put three and a half percent down and, and, and put yourself in a precarious situation. Interest rates are going up. Now we'll see some changes. Then we have the shadow inventory, the off market stuff. That's not here yet. It's underground, under the radar. It's not available unless you go actively out to get it. These properties are not on market. These are the pre foreclosures, the probate issues, the just tax deed stuff, things that are, again, before they're taken back by the bank. That's where the opportunities are the opportunities to get cheaper properties in that sort of market niche. Um, but they're not available. They're not just sitting there for us for, to take. You have to actually go out and physically get them. What I mean by that is market to them, engage the homeowners, engage the sellers, do deals, help them, and be the solution to get access to these properties. That's the whole point of, of what we do here. So interesting that that's how it plays out. So as I said, the rolling distress statistics, I think that's uh, ongoing now. I mean, some of the stuff I just read today, still thinking about, you know, two point something million people, 2.4 million people in you know, delinquent in their mortgages, some of those still in forbearance, whatever, whatever. Okay, so, and again, if, if they're saying 2.4 million low end, we know it's more than that. As I always mentioned, we've heard the range from 3 million to over 10 million. Let's put it in the middle as a fair number. 2 million people plus were in forbearance. 1.2 million people have left the forbearance program um, uh, you know, because that's what's happening. They're moving into the, the solution-based stuff and they're having problems making ends meet with that, okay? Um, 50 percent uh, delinquent loans are not in any loss mitigation program which means they're, they're ripe for foreclosure processing 72 percent of the of those that are in a loss mitigation program so they've come out of forbearance or doing stuff with their lender are not paying which means they're ripe to move from the loss mitigation into foreclosure uh pro into the foreclosure bucket so this is what's going to happen so things are not rosy i can tell you that the narrative of how this is going to like how the narrative wants you to believe this is going to be dealt with which is oh you have equity in your house, simply sell, pay off what you owe, move on, life will be good. That's not going to happen because people who haven't paid chip away at their equity, number one. Number two, people who aren't paying their mortgage or have these financial problems have a cash flow situation. And what happens in a cash flow situation? Well, you basically don't buy things or, or, or have, a, you know, like I guess that, that expenditures that you don't need to do. So, to sell at the equity you've earned, you're going to have to have a premium property. You're going to, if you want to be the, you know, sell with the high equity, you're going to have to have a new roof and and and, and you know refinish kitchens and and rehab bathrooms and stuff like that. You want to sell the premium, you got to have a premium property. Well, people aren't going to have that, so they're going to be offered less to their properties. Now, yeah, if you're the only one on the street that's selling, you might do okay, but the minute two or three more come on, come on the street that are in this situation, well, that's going to be com competition, which means price points drop. Couple that with buyers who now are going, I need to buy, but now interest rates are 5%. Their buying power is diminished, so that, so that you're going to have to account for that. So the, this whole narrative that we can just, anybody in distress can simply sell because of their newfound wealth and equity is a red herring. It's misleading at best. Will some people do it? Sure they can. But as more and more people come out of the woodwork and face the music and have to deal with their problems with their mortgage and their properties, that's not going to be a solution, all right? The longer you stay in your home without paying, the more the chips away at your equity. And quite, and I, I tell you, when the, these companies make these, the, you know, uh, I guess you could say statements on how much equity there is, they take a look at the property, when it was purchased, and what the loan balance was, all right, at time of purchase. And they look at, oh, what it's worth now. Well, they don't look at what happens in between purchase to now. They don't know if you're behind your mortgage. They don't know how far you're behind, what the what the dollar values are, and that. So, see, they don't they don't understand, or they don't talk about, or or even factor in that equity component or that loss equity component. That's why things are going to change, and and that's why what you hear is not always um, accurate in, in in the marketplace here. All right, increase in unique unique situations, more deaths, more states in probate, more HOA homeowner association foreclosures are happening. 
more layers. What I mean by that is multiple issues per transaction per deal now. We'll have a foreclosure plus a required probate or more things going on. Landlord fallout, like like they're saying, the landlords are getting hit now, and they're going to have fallout from this not bad couple of years. They can't receive money. Um, there's no money to be out there. They, they're not getting it for various reasons and holdbacks and stuff. It's just a mess for landlords still, all right? They're still trying to evict people. In certain states, your eviction process can be six months to a year. So how can you actually make money? Um, you know, How can you carry a place, have someone not paying, and they're not participating with you to, to get the rent availability um, uh, I guess you know stuff from the from the government. So the the rent stuff that's out there. So and also we're going to see a lot more unpaid property tax going forward. That's going to be a financial issue. Also, people who pass away um, aren't there to pay the property tax. That's going to be a sleeper opportunity for investing in the near future. So I'm I'm kind of bullish on that. So as I talked to you before, my short sell program is kind of really gone now. It's going to come back in a different format. But I've got the distressed deal architect or distressed property architect right now. It's available right now. So please jump on if you want to inquire. It's going to be eight weeks of live training. There's going to be you know preliminary training we'll do now and post training as well things i'm going to fill in that are interesting and very useful but we're going to have eight weeks the topics are going to be foreclosures auctions and reos all right pre-foreclosures and short sales week two tax deeds probate estate subject to the mortgage concept vacant land build to rent build to flip opportunity and end the airbnb opportunity these are the things that are really uh, are going to work are pertinent or, or can can you can take advantage of where we're going in the housing market now. Okay, that's why I'm talking about this. There's more I'll talk about for sure and, and engage, but th th that's going to be the the eight sort of you know I guess you could say main main talking points, main main our main niches or niches you want to call it. Um, depends on where you're from. Uh, we up in Canada we have the French inflection, of course. So we say niche, but the point is that um, we talk about these, and this is kind of like as we move into the distressed housing market more, and things are going to happen. I'm, I'm telling you and showing you the opportunities where to acquire properties and where to make money in this marketplace. So that's what I wanted to show you guys there. So reach out to me. I'm, putting, I'm getting people in on that right now. All right, guys. So uh, and why you want to do that? Because you're going to get your hands on opportunities that other people aren't going after. Deals like this where you can jump into some, some good equity uh, properties uh, and, and actually have opportunity to buy cheap, you know, fix and flip with some income, cash flow rental uh, with opportunities or Airbnb with, you know, they're all cash flow opportunities. So that's what I'm trying to show you guys that there'll be lots of opportunities. So please want to reach out to me. There's my email. Reach out to me. Give me your phone number. We'll uh, uh, create a time to chat and go from there. And once again, uh, guys, I appreciate the views. I appreciate the um, likes, comments. Please share the video with your family and friends. If you're not a subscriber, please subscribe and connect with me on this stuff. Those that I've connected before, re-up re your connection guys because things are changing my world's changing the real estate world's changing and you know the opportunities are now and, and the, the, the doors will be closed and you won't be able to get into um participate in this uh, in the near future so act now uh before the masses uh infiltrate the marketplace all right okay guys take care look forward to speaking with you a couple days